I thought I had the tenor of things, and now I'm just going back to the basics. Whoa. Oh, that's bad. It's not that's like I know from back home. <laughs> Is that good or bad? That's a good thing. <laughs> All right, that's ladies and gentlemen. Woo! The Theology of Science, Part 2. Uh, got good news and bad news. You're probably going to be here all night. That's the good news. I mean, the bad, I mean, whatever news you want to take, however you want to make it. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I do not have an intro. I don't care about an intro tonight because we're going to hit the ground running. We're going to hit the ground running fast, and you're probably going to be writing fast, and you're probably going to be begging me for the notes. They're $10 each, and I'm kidding. I'll give them away free. Um, but this is going to be really good, guys. Really good. Our text for tonight is John 1, 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So if you know that, then to know that there are scientific facts put in there by the creator should be should not be any problem for you to believe. And then we have Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory Let's try that again. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. A lot to cover tonight. Let's dive in. Let's dive in with a vengeance. Which is his, saith the Lord. Amen. Space, folks, is like a fabric. But we often think it's empty, but it's not. Did I get an amen already? That's awesome. So. Right. From the mouth of babes. Yeah. He has perfected praise. Okay. Astronomers often refer to the fabric of time, the fabric of space time. Albert Einstein, as part of his theory of general relativity, proposed that space was like a fabric in 1916. But the Bible has always treated space like a fabric. In Job 9.8, it shows that the, that the fabric of space is spread. So the Job 9.8, which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. Isaiah 40 verse 22 shows that it is spread like a curtain and a tent. Anybody go camping? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Isaiah 64, 1 says that it can be torn. You never thought space could be torn, but that's exactly what this says here. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. And it can be rolled up. Revelation 6, 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. The Bible treats space like a fabric, like a curtain, like a tent, like a piece of cloth. It's the way, it's, it's the, way the word testifies of that, and yet we didn't even have that understanding or even that thought until 1916 with Albert Einstein. Here's another one that's going to blow some minds. Space is made of dark matter. Isaiah 53, excuse me, Isaiah 50, verse 3. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering. Now, he doesn't just say the heavens are dark. He uses the terms clothed and sackcloth. Is God being poetic? Or is there something else at work here? Consider everything that I just said about space being a fabric. Cosmetologists, or excuse me, cosmologists, Probably cosmetologists too if they dabble in. Well, well, I, I, seems like I need to make up some time here. Uh, I need to make up for that. Cosmologists and cosmetologists that speculate in cosmology now. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna answer for that one. Uh, they now speculate that over 85 percent of the known universe is comprised of dark matter with energy, with dark energy and black holes. It is called dark because it doesn't appear to interact with the electromagnetic field, which means it does not interact in any way with electromagnetic radiation and is therefore difficult to detect. We have not yet proven the existence of dark matter, but it is highly implied by various observations from those who study space very carefully. And it cannot be explained a lot of their models can't be explained unless more matter is present than can be seen or detected. But there are various phenomena that cannot be explained unless dark matter exists. 
In short, if dark matter does not exist, most of what we know about space doesn't hold water. General relativity is a theory of gravitation which is largely proven and which predicted black holes. This general relativity can only be true in space if there is more matter present than what we can see. Once it is proven to exist through direct means, it will be another feather in the biblical cap since God said he clothed the heavens in darkness. And we're going to get into black holes a little bit later too. That's going to be interesting. We also find that the sun has a circuit. It travels in a circle. The sun has a circuit. It travels in a circle. Psalm 19, 4 through 6. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run the race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof, speaking of the sun. Some scientists of the past scoffed and ridiculed this verse, thinking it taught that the sun revolved around the earth. That's not what it says. The sun isn't stationary, though, either. It doesn't stay in the same place. We now know that the sun is traveling through space at approximately 600,000 miles per hour, taking us along for the ride. It is literally moving through space in a huge circle, just as the Bible stated 3,000 years ago. It isn't moving very fast in astronomical terms, folks, but it is still moving. Its trajectory would indicate that it would take about 225 million years to make one orbit around the Milky Way. But the point is, it's moving. And it is moving in an orbital manner, in a circular manner, in a circuit, just as the Bible said. And by the way, it was Galileo that discovered that the sun is traveling in space in 1612. Oh, no. Can I get a witness? The Psalms were written before 1612. Amen. Amen. The stars are stones of fire. Ezekiel 28, 13, and 14. Speaking uh, to Lucifer, this says, Thou hast been an eat in the garden of God. And skip down. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Lucifer was an Eden which was on the earth. He had the power to go up and down between the earth and God's throne room. The stones of fire here uh, were pictured as surrounding him when he ascended and descended between God's throne room and the earth. These stones of fire are stars, folks. Stars were discovered to be burning hydrogen through nuclear fusion, which releases light and heat. Can I get a witness? That sounds a whole lot like a fire. <laughs> this was discovered in 1925 by Cecilia Payne. But you know what? God knew it all along. In fact, he's the one who created it that way. Stars give off noise frequencies. Job 38, 7. When the morning stars sang together. Now, yes, we can also say, well, this is uh, about angels. But here's the thing. Oftentimes in the Bible, we find double meanings. And so when we look at the morning stars singing together, that shows that there's frequencies. There's some kind of noise coming from the stars. It's a musical noise, which was discovered in 1945. Hello, somebody. Each star is unique. 1 Corinthians 15, 41 says, One star differeth from another star in glory. Centuries after the advent, or centuries before, rather, the advent of the telescope, the Bible declared what only God and the angels knew, that each star varies in how much and the quality of life they put forth. We wouldn't expect someone in the first century to know this. Now, you can look up at the sky, even today, with, with the naked eye, and you can see maybe little minute differences. Maybe there's a slight difference in the shade. Maybe one's a little brighter. But then again, it just might be that it's closer instead of further away. You can't tell if you really want to get down to brass tacks. And yet, this man in the first century, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, 
wrote one star different from another star in glory. How did he know that? Because God told him. The stars cannot be counted. Jeremiah 33, 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. At any given time, only about 5,000 stars are visible to the naked human eye, and that would include the time of Jeremiah. Any given time. 5,000 stars. Yet God stated that man could not number the stars. I've never been bored enough to try. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I can tell you there's a lot of them up there. There's, and there's more than we can see. All right. And I guarantee you that, that with my visual impairment, your naked eye is a lot better than mine. Anyway. It was not until the 17th century that our buddy old Galileo looked through a telescope and stood there with his mouth wide open and his jaw on the floor. Today, astronomers estimate, because stars still can't be numbered, that there are 1 times 10 to the 25th power stars. That's a 1 followed by 25 zeros, folks. Whew! Or to put it in kids' language, 10,000 billion trillion. <laughs> <laughs> the scientists and, and you know what it, it wouldn't it be just like God if we could number if we could like come up with a, with like the exact number that he'd have one that's like out somewhere just to go <laughs> see you can't do it anyway <laughs> the scientists who came up with this number will still admit to you that it's a very low estimate here's one that blew my mind the constellation Pleiades is bound and the constellation Orion is loose and moving apart. Job 38, 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? God is essentially asking Job, what power do you think you have compared to me? God is saying what Job cannot do, he can. Astronomy has discovered these facts about these two constellations. Pleiades is a group of 250 stars in the constellation Taurus that travels the universe together like a pack of dogs. Same direction, same motion. They are essentially 250 member stars acting as one. And I'm gonna tell you what, we, us as church, we can learn a lot from those stars. Mm -hmm. you, know them, you know them right. We need to be acting as one too. Orion's belt is comprised of two separated stars with one star cluster. And these stars are moving in opposite directions. The gravity of Orion is not enough to hold the star cluster together. We only discovered that relatively, relatively recently. But God told Job that. Job, a long, 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 long time ago. That was in the Bible before we ever discovered it. The same verse also shows that stars have gravitational forces which wasn't discovered by science until 1850. The same verse. Can't stop buying the sweet influences of Pleiades. Gravitational forces of the stars. Here's another one. Arcturus is more than one star. Job 38, 20, uh, 32. Can't stop guide Arcturus with his sons. Arcturus is one of the brightest stars in the galaxy, but that's only part of the truth, folks. In 1971, the year I was born, <clears throat> I just dated myself. All right. I mean, in a big way. In 1971, folks, it was discovered that Arcturus is actually a close-knit cluster of 53 stars that appear from a distance as one big star. Fitting what God said about Arcturus and his sons. <clears throat> what was formerly known for centuries as one big star has now been renamed the Arcturus stream by science. It's no longer just called Arcturus, it's called the Arcturus stream because of the sheer number of stars. Arcturus is also going over 10 times the speed of all other stars, 257 miles per second. Erwin, you think your car moves fast. Anyway, 
Job 3.9 tells us that black holes exist. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it look for light but have none. Dark stars? Remember, God, God limited himself to the language that the people could speak. Okay? That the people could understand. And God knew what language would be used, but people before the 20th century would not know what the word black hole meant. A black hole is a star that is imploded to where the gravity is so powerful not even light can escape. It is a dark star. Their existence was not known until the 20th century. Einstein's general theory of relativity showed their possibility in 1916. The term was coined in 1967 by John Wheeler, but the first discovery of a black hole was not until that blessed year of 1971. <laughs> Yet here in Job 3 verse 9, we have God talking about dark stars. Hello, somebody. Oh, by the way, the universe is expanding. During the early 20th century, most scientists, including Einstein, believed the universe was unchanging. It was static. There was no change in it. Uh, others believed it should have collapsed due to the sheer force of gravity. When we talk about global warming, they thought there was going to be global squishing at the time. Then in 1929, astronomer Edwin, Edwin Hubble easy for me to say, showed that distant galaxies were receding from the Earth. They're going away. They're moving further and further away. And the further away they were, the faster they were moving. This discovery revolutionized the field of astronomy. Einstein, later in his life, admitted his mistake. And today, most astronomers agree with the Creator, what the Creator told us a millennia ago. The universe is expanding. More than millennia ago, guys, actually, thinking about it. Multiple millennia ago. The universe is expanding. Repeatedly, God declares that he stretches out the heavens. Jeremiah 10, 12. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. Jeremiah 51, 15. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he sitteth <coughs> upon the circle of the earth <coughs> and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 42, 5. Thus saith the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out. Oh, I'm not done. Job 9, 8, which alone spreadeth out the heavens. Zechariah 12, 1, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens. Woo! I think God wants us to get a point here that the heavens are being stretched out. And as we look at what astronomers call the red shift, it bears it out. Now, the problem with science is that they want to extrapolate that backwards to a big bang. Oh, well, that was, you go back far enough, you get a big bang and everything. Where did the matter and energy come from? They can't tell you for that big bang. Okay? I believe that God created the universe just as it was and then started stretching it out. But they want to take it right all the way back and make it a dot on a page. First of all, if anybody knows anything about water, there's only so far you can squish water. Okay? I mean, they, they, they take water, and they'll make little, I don't want to call them water guns, because that's a little different than what I'm talking about, but they, they, they put water, they put a lot of pressure on water, and it can actually cut stone. You can't push water past a certain point, so I don't know how they're getting all that water in that little dot. But anyway. Moving on. That's a little extra. The earth is a sphere. <coughs> Sorry if there are any flat earthers in here. You're free, to throw, you're free to throw rotten fruit if you have any, but it's true. The earth is a sphere. Isaiah 40, verse 22, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Not a square, not an oval. Not flat. It's a flat circle. Yeah, it's a flat circle. I've heard that before. But here's the problem with that. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, the word <laughs> circle is the Hebrew choke. It can also mean circuit or compass. Okay? 
The Bible agrees with hard science that the earth is a sphere. That Hebrew word chug gives that impression that the earth is a sphere. It gives that message. Now, I've personally flown around the earth both ways, which would be impossible if the earth were flat. If you get high enough in the air, you can see the curvature of the earth, and I have. Geometry also proves that the earth is a sphere. If you take a triangle and you make it big enough, it adds up to more than 90 degrees. The only way that you can do that is to compute for a fourth dimension of curvature. It's the only way. Isaiah was written 300 years before Aristotle even put forth the suggestion that the earth was a sphere. And even then, it wasn't until the 15th century that we were scientifically sure. Not only is the earth a sphere, the earth is a, is a revolving sphere with day and night occurring. Occur wow. I'm tripping over my tongue, Pastor. I'm tripping over my tongue. The earth is a revolving sphere with day and night occurring simultaneously. Luke 17, 34 through 36. I tell you in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Okay? This is a depiction of simultaneous day and night. Somebody sleeping and someone else is working. That would necessitate a spherical revolving earth. So when the Lord comes back, some will be asleep while others are working in the field, which could not be done at night. They didn't have flashlights or street lamps. Okay, all they had was the stars and the moon, and that was not enough. So they would not be able to work in the middle of the night. The earth also freely floats in space, Job 26, verse 7. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. The earth freely floats in space. Let's move on to geology for a second, shall we? The Bible says that the earth is hot inside. Job 28, 5. As for the earth under it is turned up as it were fire. You dig down below the crust, you get magma. Volcanoes erupt. What's coming up? What's underneath the earth, which is which is liquid fire, essentially. And I ain't talking about some spicy sauce you put on wings. I'm talking about real liquid fire. Okay. The mantle is very soft like liquid candy, but I wouldn't eat it. We see that the earth has fire inside it, which we call the mantle, something science did not know until 1909. Also, <clears throat> we still can't drill into the earth. We still can't. We can only go so far. <coughs> Jeremiah 31, 37. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searches out, searched out beneath. We can't search it out. We can't. It can't be searched out. It says, if the foundations of the earth searched out beneath. You can't do it. Every attempt to drill into the earth, folks, has been a failure. The best geologists can do is speculate based on computer models and readings of complicated machines that extract information from the earth. That's it. That's as far as they can go. Okay? Continents. Here's another one. Continents have been divided from each other. Genesis 1.9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So all the waters were in one place, which means all the land was also in one place. It gets better. Let's go on to oceanography. This one did. This one blew my mind even more than, than the astronomy. 2 Samuel 22, 16 says that there are channels in the sea. That means the oceans have rivers at the bottom of them. The word for channels is the Hebrew apike. Sounds Spanish, doesn't it? But it's not. It's translated as brooks, rivers, and streams in other verses. It was reported in February 2014 in a magazine called The New Scientist. Drain, and I'm quoting, drain all the Earth's oceans, and you would find 
that underwater rivers have gouged a maze of conduits known as the abysmal channels, or the abyssal channels, not the abysmal ones. Of course, it could be abysmal if you got stuck down there, but the abyssal channels. <clears throat> you almost think I'd be saying those things on purpose just to make a joke, but I swear it's a mistake. <laughs> uh, just trying to change it into something so I don't cry. Uh, an embarrassment. These rivers at the bottom of the ocean do not seem possible, but we have discovered that they do exist. These underwater rivers carry high concentrations of salt and sediment on the bottom of the ocean. According to Gebco, the international authority tasked with mapping the seafloor, these rivers were discovered in the mid-1800s. Knowledge of the seafloor increased rapidly when the, when the sonar was invented. That's the use of sound waves to determine distance and movement. That was invented in 1916. Yet all the way back in 2 Samuel, God informed us of the channels of the sea. The oceans have springs at the bottom of them. Job 38, 16, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea or hast thou walked in search of the depth? For centuries, it was thought that the oceans were sustained by rivers and rain, folks. In the 1970s, only around 50 years ago, a submarine was invented that could withstand 6,000 pounds of pressure per square inch, and scientists found springs on the ocean floor. Not just rivers, but springs. Water coming up from even deeper. If you could swim to the ocean floor, folks, all you would find is total darkness, and you'd be crushed before you made it anywhere near the bottom. So, of course, Job had never explored the springs of the sea. But God knew. And he said so. The oceans also have mountains on the bottom of them. Jonah 2, 5 through 6. And water, the water covers me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me around. The weeds were wrapped around my head. The existence of seaweed. Anyway, let's move on. I went down to the bottoms of the oceans. The earth with her bars was about me forever, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. Where? Under the sea. There are mountains on the ocean floor. We had no idea of this until that blessed decade of the 1970s with the help of that submarine. Oh, there's more. The oceans have currents, Psalm 8, 8, called the paths of the seas. 3,000 plus years ago, God taught about these paths. In fact, the father of oceanography, Matthew Moray, was a Bible believer. Can't wait to meet him. He researched the oceans based on his reading of Psalm 8. And in his research, he found that currents follow very specific paths and published a book called The Physical Geography of the Sea, based on his research in the year 1855. So the Bible not only had this information, guys, but once again, this Bible, this word of God, inspired a believing scientist to go looking for it, and he found it. Now using these paths of the sea, navigators have been able to vastly reduce the time it takes to get, one, to get a ship from one place to another, which was very, very, very useful during World Wars I and II. Hydrology and meteorology is our next step. The circulation of water is found in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 1 7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers came, thither they return again. Rivers run into the ocean, causing waters to be pushed northward, helping with distribution of solar energy around the earth and helping to maintain the climate because that solar heat is moved from the equator to the poles, toward the poles. Because of this movement, waters make their way back to the rivers, which again run into the sea or are evaporated and fall back down because of the water cycle, which we're about to get into as well. The circulation of water, guys, is found right here in Ecclesiastes 1.7. The water cycle itself, which was not discovered until 1580 by a scientist named... Bernard Palisi is in the Bible. The hydrologic cycle, a.k.a. the water cycle. <clears throat> Let's look at this. Jeremiah 10, 13. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, 
and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. There's your water vapor evaporating. There's your water vapor, your water evaporating and rising in the air. Water vapor becomes clouds and stays there for some time. Job 26, 8, he bindeth up the waters and his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. The clouds build up and move. Job 37, 11, also by watering he wearieth the thick cloud. Now, these two verses are explained in this little fact here. As long as the H2O stays vapor in its gas form, with microscopic lighter than air liquid droplets that can float inside a cloud until it changes more to a liquid form and becomes too heavy to float, it stays where it is. So the clouds are building up and they're moving. And we also find in Job 37, 11, uh, he scattereth his bright clouds. Sorry, I didn't put the other part of that, my bad. He scattereth his bright clouds, so the clouds are moving. Then water vapor becomes drops of, of rain. Drops of rain, drops of water coming down, hitting you in the head, ruining your day, but moving on. Job 37, or excuse me, Job 36, 27, and 28. For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. That's why we have umbrellas. Abundant rain. Raindrops keep falling on my head. Anyway, a, a song from that blessed decade in the 70s. <laughs> <clears throat> so, folks, there are updrafts. It helps suspend the smaller drops of water in the air, and then the drops get too heavy. The updrafts can't keep them there, and there you go. Here comes the water. Here comes the rain. Water then falls as precipitation. Amos 9.6. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Woo! I'm going to start preaching about science. Ecclesiastes 1.7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come through that they return again. That's runoff. So not only does that verse show us about the circulation of water, it shows us the runoff. The, the rivers run into the sea. Get excited. We now understand that the water cycle involves evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and runoff, and all of this was in God's word long before the hydrologic cycle was discovered in 1580. Oh, there's more. The dimensions for a vessel that has buoyancy is in Genesis 6:15. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Noah's ark was the largest sea vessel in recorded history prior to 1858. Uh, now there was a guy in Greece by the name of Archimedes. He discovered the principle for buoyancy two to 300 years before Christ walked the earth. Can I get a witness that Moses wrote Genesis way before that? And notice the dimensions of the ship were 30 by 5 by 3. When you boil it down, when you reduce it. Today, shipbuilders understand that the buoyant craft of any size must have a length that is six times that of the width, or it will not float. And yet here we have that in Genesis 6.15. The sixth chapter of Genesis. About 4,500 years ago. Or 4,500 years. Because this, this earth, well, yeah, about 4,500 years ago. My bad. I can tell one of those brain things. I'm getting old. Anyway, meteorology. Rain produces lightning. This wasn't discovered until the 19th century. That it was rain that produced lightning. You would have thought, somebody would have thought that, hey, every time it rains, there's this weird flashing in the sky, but it wasn't until the 19th century that somebody went, hmm, you know what, that, that's very interesting. According to Silinx.gov, lightning come, and yes, that's a real Silinx. Okay, actually, no, my bad, Sijinx. That's even worse. Sijinx, and it's a .gov website. 
Lightning comes from electrical charges that build up within a storm cloud. Genet, or Jeremiah 10, 13, when he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend to the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasuries. He maketh lightnings with rain. Hello, somebody. When did we discover that again? 19th century. Can I get a witness that Jeremiah was written before the 19th century? Woo. Oh, it's going even further than that, guys. Air has weight. Job 38. Looks like I missed that one. Okay. My bad, I put Job 38, 24. Just ignore that. Uh, Job 28, 25. Where did I accidentally go backwards? Oh, well, it is what it is. Can't fix it now. Job 28, 25 says, to make the way for the winds, and he weigheth the waters by measure. For centuries, scientists believed that air was weightless. Aristotle conjectured that air has weight, but Galileo, who, was, by the way, was born in 1542, proved it by developing a way to not only prove that air has weight, but to measure the actual weight of air. And yet, here we have the book of Job. Declaring that God established a way for the wind. In recent years, meteorologists have calculated that the average thunderstorm holds thousands of tons of rain. To carry this load, air must have both mass and weight. It has to. Now let's look at the jet stream, a.k.a. the circular motion of the wind on Earth. Until the 20th century, scientists believed that the air only blew straight ahead. The jet stream was discovered by Japanese meteorologist, oh, I'm going to butcher this, Wasaburo Uishi. I think I got that right. An American pilot, Wiley Post, whose name is much easier to pronounce, discovered that his airspeed measurements were different than his ground measurements, which showed that he was flying in an air current. This was in 1934. The term jet stream was co coined in 1939 by German mete meteorologist Heinrich Seilkopf. And knowledge of it increased during World War II when pilots re reported variations in wind speed when flying back and forth between North America and Europe. With all of this, it was back in Ecclesiastes when the Holy Spirit said this through Solomon, the wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north, it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his servants. Oh, by the way, sunlight causes the wind. By what way is the light parted which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Job 38, 24. As the ground of the earth heats up, the hotter air becomes less dense and rises, causing cooler air to rush in and take its place. These are called convection currents, and they're a direct result of sunlight making the ground hotter. 20th century, folks. The Bible shows that the Earth's air moves in a circular motion. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north, it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to the circuits. The world didn't discover the circuit of the Earth's air until the 1730s. Because of the way the air moves all around the Earth, every human being has breathed in air. Okay, dig this. Dig this, okay? There is a principle in science called Caesar air, which states that everyone living today, because of the way the air moves around the Earth, has breathed in a molecule at least one molecule between one and two in every breath that was once breathed by someone living in ancient Rome. I don't want to call it Caesar air. I want to call it Jesus air. He lived in Rome. <laughs> every human being in almost every breath is breathing at least one molecule of air that Jesus himself breathed. It literally is his breath in our lungs. In two ways. The 
The breath of life in Genesis breathed into every person. And because of the motion of the air on earth, literally the air that he breathed when he lived in Rome. Woo! Holy oxygen, Batman. You had to you have to have been old like me to understand that reference, but it's okay. Oh guys, it, it, this is this is crazy. There's possible evidence for string theory in other dimensions of reality. And I'm not talking about the like Marvel and DC or the, the old show from you know the 90s sliders where there's alternate realities. Not what I'm talking about at all. I'm not going there. There are no alternate realities, I think. I think pretty much they've shown that, even though there are some that still speculate. But other dimensions of reality do exist. Okay? If there's very strong evidence to that. So it's so strong that it's important to give it a look. See, first of all, the Hebrew scholar Nachmanides in the 12th century came up with the idea of ten dimensions after intensely studying the Hebrew in Genesis. That the universe has ten dimensions. Four are knowable, and six are beyond our ability to experience. This will take a long time to explain. I'm just going to bare bones it. Okay? We will leave it at this. String theory, which is a theory based on discoveries of quantum physics uh, developed in the 20th century, late 20th century. Uh, actually, it started in the earlier 20th century, but it gained steam in the late 20th century. It says essentially the same thing. There are 10 dimensions. Some theories go as far as to say 12, but these are in the <clears> minority. <throat> Most of them that adhere to string theory believe that there are 10. So both Nachmanides, who studied the Hebrew of Genesis, and string theory say that there are 10 dimensions of reality. They both said that there are four that are knowable and six that are not. So we have three dimensions that we are cognizant of, actually four that we're cognizant of, okay? Um, the three dimensions of space and the fourth dimension of time, okay? And that's why astronomers and others call, uh, call the four dimensions space-time. The, there are six dimensions we cannot understand, we cannot see. They're curled into themselves at the subatomic level. Meaning that's smaller than atoms, folks. The crazy thing is that the fact that they're curled into the subatomic level actually means that even though we cannot experience them, they are still everywhere. Are you lost? Is it clear as mud? Let me explain as best as I can with my limited knowledge. Most people think they can cut something in half indefinitely. You just keep cutting it in half, cutting it in half. I mean, theoretically, it gets too small for the, you know, but you can, you can just keep going. You can't. <coughs> When something is cut to what is known as Planck length, which is 10 to the minus 20 the size of a proton, can I get a witness that's really small? It loses what is known as locality. Folks, you have locality. Wherever you go, there you are. That's locality. Whenever scientists have tried to make something smaller than Planck length, something weird happens. The particle loses locality. It appears to be everywhere. The six dimensions discovered we cannot see have curled themselves to the point at which they're even smaller than Planck length and thus are everywhere. Yet we cannot experience them because they are curled too small to be experienced. Does that sound like a contradiction? Yeah, they think so too. The scientists, it, ba it baffles them. They don't understand it. They don't get it, but it's true. They cannot make anything smaller than Planck length because if they do, it loses locality and appears everywhere. And this is one of the reasons that Scientific American in 2006, I believe it was June of 2006, said that our universe appears to be nothing but a huge three-dimensional picture, a hologram. Is this clear as mud? I don't understand it either. We aren't alone because they don't understand it. <laughs> but it is nonetheless shown to be true. Some might accuse me of stretching here, but I don't think so. In fact, my wife tells me I don't stretch enough. And so does my chiropractor. But I'm not stretching this, okay? 
This is not something, I'm not making this up at all, and I'm not stretching facts. The fact that a Hebrew scholar studied the Hebrew scriptures in Genesis and published a book in which he stated that the Hebrew scriptures showed four dimensions that we know and six that we do not, then seeing the same conclusion coming about by scientists studying the mechanics at the subatomic level has a correlation that is too strong to ignore. Now, while I think that based on the Bible, again, we can reject that idea that there are alternate realities or parallel worlds, that's the stuff of science fiction. It may be that these other dimensions is where we find the spiritual realm, and I think I can show that in Scripture. Adam and Eve, folks, had their entire perception changed. In a previous message, I talked about uh, how they were clothed in light, and I showed you how that, how that was. They went after the sin from being clothed in light to realizing they were naked, Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew they were naked. Now their eyes were open to the four dimensions, but slammed shut to the spirit world. The ancient rabbis always believed that originally humanity could see the spirit world. In our current carnal state with the sin nature, if you could see into the spirit world, it would scare the snot out of you. And I, that's evidenced in the Bible by the fact that everyone from the prophet Daniel to the Virgin Mary seeing an angel had to be told not to be afraid. There's other biblical evidence that we have lost the ability to perceive in, uh, some of the dimensions of reality in 2 Kings 6. Starting in verse 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. Open his eyes. His eyes were open. That's how he was saying, hey, there's nobody around us. We're outnumbered. Help us. And Elijah said, hey, don't worry about it. There's more with us than there are with And I'm curious, going, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> All right, God, show this guy something. Open his eyes. Amen. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. We have in 2 Kings 6 a situation in which the king of Syria has sent an army to capture Elisha. Elisha's servant is scared. And Elijah comforts the young man by telling him there are more with them than there are against them. And then says, God, open his eyes. Elijah prayed, and the spiritual vision was temporarily restored to that young man. He was able to see into the spirit world to see all the angels protecting them. And we could spend a whole sermon on the times where God peeled back the veil to show Someone, something in the spirit world. We can talk about Peter. We can, take, we can talk about James. We can talk about John. We can talk about Paul, Daniel, even a money grubbing prophet and his donkey were once shown in this, shown something from the spirit world. But the point here is that Elijah prayed for God to open his servant's eyes. And when God did open the servant's eyes, the servant saw what was happening in the spirit realm on earth right then and there. Let's look at some descriptions that are going to, we're going to have uh, let's, some descriptions of the resurrection here. First John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That means glorified. Glorified. If you look in 1 Corinthians 15, talks about the glorified Christ and us being glorified with him. When you have your glorified body, you're going to be able to see the glory of God. Your eyes will be open and you shall see all ten dimensions of reality. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You haven't seen it. You're going to. How about John 3, 3? Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We'll have the ability to see into the spirit realm restored to us. Ask Peter, James, and John what the transfiguration was like. Ask Paul what the throne room of God looks like. He couldn't tell you because he said he was essentially, he said it's not, it's not lawful for me to tell you that. Revelation is chock full of the Apostle John seeing into the spirit world, given visions by Jesus. 
And string theory gives a possible explanation to our vision being limited to only those four dimensions, just as Nachmanides found through his study of the Hebrew Genesis. Oh, it gets better, and we're, we're getting close to the close, I promise. We find a prophecy, we're going to look here at, at modern knowledge and technology, real, real briefly, it had have been shorter if I didn't trip over my tongue. Daniel 12, 4, but thou, Daniel, shut up the words. He didn't say shut up, Daniel. He said shut up the words. And seal the books even at the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and now it shall be increased. On November 3rd, 2018, the Digital Journal website noted this, quote, until the year 1900, human knowledge approximately doubled every century. However, by 1950, human knowledge doubled every 25 years. And 2,000, human, human knowledge would double every year. Now our knowledge is almost doubling every day. Hello, somebody. Knowledge is increasing. Men would do things that would destroy the earth. Revelation eleven eighteen, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that thou should judge us, that thou, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and, the, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name shall small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. That last part's where I want you to focus. Evolution imagines that things are getting better. Lord, open their eyes. The Bible foresaw what has really occurred today. Pollution, destruction, and corrupt dominion. In fact, this is a prophecy regarding technology. It wasn't until the 19th century, the late 19th century, that we had the first time in history when we were able to cause so much devastation to the planet. And our power to do so has grown exponentially since the Industrial Revolution through activities such as massive deforestation and weapons of mass destruction. Remember I talked to you last time that a nuclear explosion in the Bible. The Bible prophesied back in the first century AD that man would commit acts to destroy the earth. And we now have the technology to do it. We find a moving and talking image in the Bible. In Revelation 13, 15, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, this could be through a video or even a three-dimensional projection. Help us, Obi-Wan. You're our only hope. We can now make that happen. In fact, we've had talking, moving images since the 1920s with the invention of talkies, movies with sound. We now have the technology in which someone can be in one place and project his or her three-dimensional image in a completely different place in real time. This is possible today. It's possible that if you have the money, you could be at home projecting your image here to where I thought you were here until I went in for my hug and didn't get anything. See? It's possible. Where'd you go? Guys, Oh, the, this could even be a reference to two-way internet communication. We can do that. We, in fact, we have a Bible study here at the church. The women study and the men study. They do it all the time. But even if the word is only referring to a talking motion picture on a screen, that technology has only existed since the 1920s. We also find evidence in televised events. People of every nation We'll see two men dead in the streets. How is that possible? Revelation 11, 8 and 9. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord is crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Three and a half days. People of multiple nations will see the bodies of two dead prophets in the streets. In the last days, we have instant access to live, as it happens, news globally at the click of our fingers so that people across the world can see live as it happens. A news feed. And not only that, but if you miss it, there are replays. 
By the way, and I'll close with this, the second coming of Christ himself may be televised. Matthew 24, 30 says this, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. All the tribes of the earth are going to see him coming in the clouds with great glory. How is that possible? In the first century, that wasn't possible. In our time, with live as it happens, news and replays at the click of your fingers, people all over this world can see Jesus coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Folks, there's not just little science in the Bible, there's a lot of science in the Bible. And next week we're going to get into the life sciences. We're not done. There's a lot more. A lot more. Anyway, uh, let's, can, Benny, Pastor Benny, will you please close us in prayer? Yeah, sure. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for your salvation that you've given us. We thank you for the care and safety that you've afforded us. That we know that we can be brave in every situation. We pray for the people in every country that is affected by war. Where innocent blood is spilled. We know that vengeance will be yours. We know that every evil act will be met with a gracious and righteous act that is in accordance with your will and your great pleasure. And we tell you, we speak truly in saying that your desire is all that we would like accomplished. That your word is our sustenance. Lord, guide us. Give us true and righteous judgment. Help us to discern the spirits from the right and the wrong. Help us to be strengthened and endure every pain and every tribulation unto the very end, knowing that our hope is you, that you will return, that you will bring order out of all chaos, and that you will wipe away every tear that we have ever shed. Amen that we will never again know any pain, but we will know forever the joy of your presence and only gratitude of being around you in the new earth, around our family, who you have made for us through your death and resurrection, the truth of God's revelation, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in your holy name. Amen.